Um, so I'm Rich McDougall. I work uh, in R&D and storage engineering at VMware. And uh, background is performance, storage, big data. And so what I want to talk about today is uh, the future of software-defined storage. To so just look at a broad industry perspective of what's going on in this space in light of all the apps changing and all the hardware changing and everything else around it. This is a secondary session. So the primary session is tomorrow morning at 9.30. It's the same talk, but if you want to refer this to somebody else, there's another uh, full session. Well, I guess it's full, but there's another session tomorrow morning as well. Um, okay, so basically what I want to talk about here is uh, we're going to go through the apps. So what's changing about apps? We're seeing apps moving to containers. We're seeing big data apps, a whole set of changes in that space. The hardware is changing under our feet as well. So the things that we design our software-defined storage for is changing pretty rapidly. And I want to go through uh, the implications of that. And then we can talk about these new workloads uh, in a little bit of detail as well. So to try and put this in some sort of perspective, uh, I created this map, which is basically try and think about the storage workloads not as being all the same. They're all, uh, they're groupable, but they're pretty different. And if you look at the software space, in the app space, it's, it's pretty diverse. So on the bottom left-hand side, we've got what I would classify as the traditional VM apps. Uh, so single node databases, um, Exchange, those types of things that you would throw inside a VM. And um, you would typically have that running on some sort of storage array. And those things, like the stats that we have, show that on average they generate like a thousand, order of 1,000 op IOPS. And maybe the bigger ones go a bit higher than that. But, the path is that we run many and many of those uh, on an on a infrastructure. So we might end up with an you know, aggregate of many thousands of IOs, but those are all fairly small and lightweight. On the right-hand side, you get the other extreme, which is the big data space. And so here, we're doing a small number of IOPS, but we're shifting gigabytes per second. In fact, the, the big data clusters are shifting sort of 40 to 100 gigabytes per second of data around across a very large number of nodes. So very, very significantly different. Like on the left-hand side here, we're doing tens of megabytes per second of I.O., and we're doing uh, 40 gigabytes per second on the right-hand side here. And then at the top, we get into these workloads, which become very specialized the further you go up. So the in-memory databases uh, that are emerging here, MemSQL, Aerospike Vault, et cetera, HANA, those are um, in-memory and real-time, but also have uh, disk requirements behind them. And so this, the requirements for those applications at the top become very IOPS and latency sensitive. And then uh, we've got some which are sort of hybrids up here in the top right. Uh, I mentioned a couple of these. So HBase is a big data workload, often on large amounts of data, like terabytes or petabytes of data, but uh, has a lot of uh, IOPS requirements because you can do random reads on it. And uh, workloads like Scality uh, is a object store that, with a bit of a twist. Like, it's an object store that stores petabytes of data, but you can do lots of random IOs, like millions of IOs per second on, on that store as well. And you'll see those being used in very particular use cases. So that's just a, a roadmap. And the question is sort of where do all these things fit in light of the software and hardware that's changing that we're now declaring uh, software to find storage. So most of what we do today down here, most of the focus of all the initial vSAN workloads, and a lot of the SDS targets in the industry are pointed down there. And these are all sort of new and interesting workloads, which we haven't targeted initially, but are extremely important. And there's a lot of other solutions in that space at the moment. So just a little bit about cl cloud and containers. Um, under the term, you would have heard some of the uh, announcements yesterday around cloud native. The term cloud native and containers has been used to describe uh, applications which have a pretty different profile as far as how you administer them. These are, di are driven by developers. Developers API APIs to provision uh, and rapidly deploy these systems. And typically, the containers is a good footprint for these. And then they're connected to a set of microservices. So if we look at the core primitive that's emerging is a container is becoming a way to do these uh, DevOps-based deployments. So let's look at what a container needs uh, underneath its storage, because ideally, we want these software-defined storage things to be able to provide for containers as well. So here we have um, a typical Linux container. And what a container is, is a Linux image. Um, well, we can do this on Windows, too, now. Uh, actually, I know someone who made it work on DOS the other day, which is scary. So containers um, basically have an image. And you create a new container by cloning the parent. And so the way this works in its most primitive form, that when, when, say, Docker first came out with uh, its version of containers, um, was that you take the root image of a running instance and you copy it. 
and you create a new one, and then you modify that with the new contents. Maybe you want to put a web server inside of it and the other, so you lay those files out on top of it. That's obviously very slow, but that's basically what's happening behind the scenes. And so you want to end up with two root images that you boot the container from, each which are unique, and the new one is provisioned with the new bits inside of it. So um, this is, that's obviously very slow and very space inefficient. So containers have moved on a little bit further, and they've got other ways of doing this now. So you can do fast clone using read-only images, so you can clone what's underneath, um, but then you end up with a non-writable non root file system. So Docker started using a union file system. This is not very popular anymore, but um, the idea was that you could take the boot image and you can clone it um, with a new file system, which would give you like a translucent file system you could look through. And now you end up with um, the original file system and a new file system, and only the delta between them is stored. So it's very quick to make a snapshot, uh, very space efficient. The trouble was the underlying infrastructure for doing this was a bit buggy and still is to this day, and there's some new uh, work, uh, a new uh, file, systems, file system that's being built to do that today. So the other piece that's being leveraged pretty heavily in the Docker ecosystem is, well, there are file systems out that natively do this. And so this gets to the core of like, what do you want your SDS to do? For the boot images, you basically want to be able to take snapshots and make the snapshots writable. And so you want that to happen super fast. There's a benchmark out there that shows you want to be able to do this for up to, say, 1,000 containers in one minute, where you can create the whole container in instances and then tear them all down again. And the way Docker layers things, you end up with something like 20 layers deep. So it's 20 layered file systems for every one of those. So we're talking about 20,000 layered file systems you want to be able to create and delete in that period of time. So the file systems are very good at doing that, like ZFS and ButterFS and some of the others underneath are being uh, leveraged to, to do this um, natively underneath. And so this is where a bit of interest is right now, is like can the uh, SDSs that provide file systems provide this native clone and snapshot support for, for, Do for Docker and containers? So that's the boot images. And then, of course, we've got the need for shared data. Uh, so if you boot up two containers on a Linux instance, they're sharing the same uh, OS, so you can actually share data between the containers. So you could mount a file system mount point in two containers and pass data between them or have your uh, static images or whatever you want inside of it. So that works well on a single node, but wouldn't it be good if you could extend that across the cluster so that every container, if you wanted to, could have a shared mount point between the containers. Okay. So there's a lot of interest in extending and integrating the clustered file systems into that space as well. So uh, that way you could have multiple containers and have a shared file system instance. So where does that come from? That would need to be a layer that's running on top of your software-defined storage solution uh, as well. So we'll basically think about it this way then. Uh, so we have a container, and we have the non-persistent boot environments, and that's what we just walked through with a need for layering uh, bootable file systems and stacking them on top of each other to create the layers that have Apache and all the other things inside of it. And then we have two types of volumes that show up in Docker. It would be either a non-shared a non or a shared, but that's where, where persistent data is. And that can be uh, attached to from a variety of different sources. So in the Docker instance, uh, the common case for this would be a MySQL instance. Most Docker things would be stateless if you, could just, like, you can just throw the container away and bring it up again. But if it's a SQL database, ideally, if you uh, shut that down or upgrade it, you want it to come back with some data, hopefully. <laughs> Your database wanted to come back again. So the volume is used to do this. And the simple way of declaring this is that the volume maps to a local drive on the machine. Um, and that means that if you destroy and recre recreate the container on that machine, then your database comes back. But I, uh, you may actually want that to appear across the cluster so that if you have a host failure, that means that you didn't lose the data that the container was attached to. So the natural thing here is to then put some technology and glue between uh, Docker containers and, the, uh, and a storage system which has a network or global uh, volume capability. So with something like vSAN, we're doing the wiring so that you can take a vSAN disk and map it to a container. And that means if the host dies, then you just bring the container up somewhere else on another machine, and your volume reappears, and all the data is, is, is in it, and you can start up your data, database again. So basically, any storage, software storage layer that has this ability to uh, create a network a, a wide volume uh, can be wired to attach it. And there's a number of initiatives going on out there. Flocker is driving some standards around the administration of this. Flocker has some solutions in this space, too. Uh, and there are a, a bunch of efforts going on for network attached. 
So that's the most obvious space. We should see solutions around that. Uh, we're prototyping this stuff now. We're doing this for vSAN. Uh, you would expect a bunch of uh, other SDSs to be providing the same capability as well. So basically, we end up with this as a summary. Uh, we've got the shared and unshared volumes. Uh, and then we've got uh, external storage that we would want to store. So there's obviously other things as well that provide storage services, like uh, an object store. So a lot of these containerized applications will want to basically use one of these three primitives. And so it's its boot image, and then it's shared and unshared volumes for storing persistent data. Uh, and then external storage is typically then an object store, uh, if it's not this. So the last category of the next generation applications is uh, thinking about big data. And software-defined storage is playing a pretty heavy role in this space, too. And there are a number of different solutions out there. And I think we'll see a convergence of the solutions over the next couple of years. But just walk through a few of them. So big data today mostly means, in a lot of environments, Hadoop and HDFS, and then an ecosystem of things that can talk to HDFS on top of it. So it's a uh, solution that's built around that one storage solution. So then we would look at HDFS and say, well, that's our SDS. It's a software-defined storage platform, and I can put Hadoop files into it or ecosystem files into it. But you know, that's not something you can treat as block storage. I can't run an Oracle on it. I can't run a, a MySQL on it. Um, so there is needs beyond just the HDFS file system. So ideally, our big data platform looks something like this, where you've got distributed storage underneath uh, that can run across the cluster. And you can present that as uh, HDFS if you need to. And there are alternates to HDFS. as MapR has a file system. GPFS has a solution. There are a number of them in this space as well. POSIX, where we would want to have a mountable file system, probably for the container shared volumes, where you want to be able to have multiple containers sharing and reading and writing the same files. Um, and block storage, where you might have like the good old database. So you might have a MySQL and an Oracle that you want to run. And those need a block storage volume behind them. So the ideal storage platform does all of this and uh, has these different presentation layers. And if you can do that, then you can basically create a platform. You can run your big data and your NoSQLs and your HPCs and everything else that fits into this as well. So there are a few ways to do this. And I'll, I'll go through this. Towards the end of the presentation, I'm going to make some conclusions about how you, you get to this point. OK, so that was a quick walk through sort of containers and what they mean and what they need. Now let's look at the hardware that's going behind uh, software-defined storage. And just look at some of the trends that are going on there as we uh, are rapidly changing stuff around to accommodate the future roadmap here. The industry is, is definitely jumping on this as well. So if we think about some of the technologies out there, uh, that same map, there are a bunch of new technologies that are showing up in the top left of that. And these are all solutions that have very high I.O. rates. So we're seeing million-plus IOP solutions. A lot of them are very low latency solutions. Some of them have quality of service control, so you can set IOPS limits and latency bounds. Um, what they're really accommodating is, well, there's actually not that many apps that sit up in the top left there, but there are a lot of these apps at the bottom that you want to consolidate heavily. So this way, I can take maybe 10,000 VMs and, and put them on one of these uh, storage services above. So the game there is mostly consolidate and increase performance for these existing applications. And there are some cases where the new apps actually fit up there as well. There's a couple of uh, outliers here. So most of these solutions on the left are IOPS-centric, very, very high numbers of IOPS. And we'll see how that's achieved. Um, there's a couple of outliers. And I just call out something like the DSSD box. Uh, that is sort of a hybrid. That does uh, something like 10 million IOPS, but it does 100 gigabytes per second as well. So it's very unique in that it can actually sustain the bandwidth limit needs that you would have from a big data solution uh, on the platform as well. So what's behind sort of a next layer down? Now we're not talking about arrays and the boxes anymore. Let's talk about the me media. Because as we get into software-defined storage, we're going to talk about like what does the hardware look like that the software would run on. And this is what the new landscape looks like. It's pretty different. And so if we think about we've cared for magnetic disks for a long time now. We've got um, d drives sort of in the order of 10 milliseconds, maybe down to, to one. Um, and we've tried to optimize the IOPS on those, those guys for a long time by speeding them up. So we've got 10K and 15K RPM drives. Well, so if you look at the latencies of some of the new things that are emerging, they're obviously much faster. So um, the, first of all, you would see that SSDs break out into two categories, which I'll go into in a bit more detail. Uh, so 
there are capacity-oriented SSDs, and there are SSDs which mostly fall under NVMe now, uh, which are IOPS optimized. And so Flash is basically breaking out into two streams. You'll see those types of drives uh, showing up as, um, as capacity-oriented and IOPS-oriented due to the technology behind them. So we're going to go into that in a bit more detail, but you can imagine there uh, the, the old-school SSDs, as you load those up, to get the throughput through them, they typically show up at about a millisecond. The newer NVMe SSDs are showing up at like as fast as 10 microseconds at a million IOPS. So a much different load curve perspective for those devices. So imagine a box that's got NVMe SSDs in it doing a million IOPS each, and you've got 10 of them. We're talking about 10 million IOPS in a, in a box just through the drives that are local in the box. Now above that, uh, we have NVM, and NVM is a, a non-volatile memory. There's a few things happening in this space, but here we're talking about mostly being able to load and store from a new type of memory that's showing up in the servers that is coming from a number of vendors, but there's, Intel's made some pretty big announcements about this recently, uh, which is a memory that is acting like a disk. So you can store to it with a store instruction, and it remembers that memory. And so this is showing up on the memory bus in the machines, which means it's extremely low latency. Uh, so we're talking about uh, under a microsecond here for access to this. And there'll be lots of it. So think, of it, think about like a terabyte of it in the server or more as you, a terabyte per dim. So um, that's the predominant thing that everyone needs to be thinking about. And is that certainly that's what's causing all the activity in the software-defined storage world. It's like, aha, how do we take advantage of this new class of memory that's going to be cheaper, faster, um, and dominant on a lot of the, the server architectures in the next few years? So if you look at the, I put a couple of uh, comments there just on the latency comparisons. The disk was 12 hours to Australia. I don't know why I picked Australia, but uh, then uh, the, the NVM would be equivalent of getting there, doing that trip in 1.8 seconds. So it's a phenomenal difference in latencies for these new uh, memory types. And then if you look at how much of that you can stuff into a server, so your memory maybe four terabytes, NVM probably similar. Um, the NVMe SSDs that are coming out, these are the IOPS oriented, maybe about 48 terabytes if you put 10 or 12 drives in. Uh, and this is based on a 12 drive system. And then if you go to the capacity oriented SSDs that are emerging, uh, 192 terabytes of flash that you could get into a server. So very, very dense. And then magnetic storage, if it still exists, <laughs> we'll talk a little bit about that um, as well, because that technology is um, getting pushed further and further down uh, as, as the different types of flash emerge. So then if we put those on a roadmap and think about it, our SSDs, or it's the older school um, devices are showing up down the left. Uh, we're seeing the different classes. This is just to reinforce the point. 2D NAND and IOPS flash showing up here on the left, uh, on the top left, which is our very high IOPS flash. And uh, 3D flash uh, showing up down on the bottom here. So what these are, so 2D flash is the predominant, like the 2D NAND is what we've been using for a long time. It's like a chip that's a two-dimensional surface, and uh, it has all the memory cells on it. And we've been reducing that in size since like the late 90s. And so we've gone from around about a micrometer per cell to a nanometer per cell in that technology, so a thousand x more denser. And that's where you've seen the uh, incremental doubling of flash density over these years. And so um, that's basically coming to a limit. Like we can't get the optics any smaller to make these uh, chips. And so um, that's actually coming to a grinding hold as far as the density. It slows down a fair bit at this point in time. Uh, but it still remains the fastest technology uh, other than the NVM that we're talking about. For, so for NAND flash, this is where the high performance high ops, think about it as a 2D chip, and we've made that faster and faster. So on the other hand, the industry has been working really hard on 3D flash. And so here we have the ability to stack multiple uh, chip layers on top of each other. So they're not in a different package or anything. They're not different circuit boards. This is actually in the um, silicon process. We're creating layers. And so here we're seeing stacks now up to about 48 deep in the enterprise class, 32 deep. And so it's not quite 32 or 48 times as dense as the one on the left because we've actually relaxed that density. So that transistor density that we had of we went 1,000 times smaller on the cells, we're now um, we're, we relaxed that a little bit by about 2x. So this, the dies are bigger, but we can stack 32 of them on top of each other. 
So what it means is this technology in the bottom left-hand corner is getting extremely dense, and it's, but, but the trade-off is speed. So you don't get many IOPS down in this space. So what's happened is basically this has become our capacity flash, and the stuff up the top has become our IOPS flash, and the two are sort of moving apart into very different categories. So at the top left, we're seeing those approach uh, millions of IOPS, uh, and in the bottom left, we're seeing these approaching around about four gigabytes per second per device. Um, but with a much lower IOP number associated with them. And you can expect to see a drive using this technology in the next year with about 16 terabytes of capacity. So that's getting pretty close to where we were with uh, magnetic disks. And there's a crossover point that is happening here. And actually, the crossover point at the top left has already happened. So last year, the crossover point became that the 15K RPM drive is more expensive than getting IOPS flash and putting that in the system. So you pretty much, can't, everyone's discontinuing 15K RPM drives as a result. Um, next year, I think we'll start to see the same happening for the capacity disks. So this 3D flash is becoming so dense and so cheap with these 16 terabyte drives that all flash systems can be designed for capacity as well. So above that, we've got uh, a couple of things happening. We'll go into those in a bit more detail here. So the non-volatile DIMMs, these are showing up on the memory bus. And Intel's X-Point, which is a new type of memory that is showing up on the uh, memory bus as well. So what those are, are different types of non-volatile memory. There's actually a bunch of standards around these now. Uh, there's another talk that goes into this specific topic in a lot of detail by Pratab and Rich Brunner. And uh, so these are the three types. So the first one is uh, called NVM, NVDIMN. And this is basically um, a, a bunch of memory and some battery backup and some flash put together on, on, the, on the DIM. And so what this means is it shows up as memory. Uh, it's very, very high performance. It's not as fast as DRAM in some cases. I think the ones we saw, some of the early ones were like five microseconds for write and 90 microseconds, uh, 90, yeah, 90 microseconds for reads. Uh, and that was because it basically writing to RAM and then it's buffering it and putting it into NAND flash. But if you do a random read, you have to pull it mostly from NAND flash, so you hit the NAND latencies on that side. So that's, uh, those are available today. UltraDIM is one of the technologies that uses this. Then the next one down is NVM, NVDIMF, which is basically the same sort of thing, but it shows up as a block device. And so now something that shows up in the system and it is accessed as uh, like sectors, like a disk, so you can read and write whole uh, blocks of data. And then the last one is the, the interesting one, which is we now have this new class of memory uh, from uh, Intel as one provider. Intel's done these announcements around this, which is non-volatile memory. They're calling it X-Point. And now we can do loads and stores to that memory. So you actually have memory that the systems and the OSs and the BIOSes have been changed such that those machines boot up. And there's memory there that you can load and store from. Now, of course, it's just like a local disk. It's not reliable in the sense that if you lose that machine, now you've lost a chunk of the storage. So when we think about uh, software-defined storage solutions, we need a way of making that memory reliable. Like there's a bunch of your application's data, so we need to re replicate that across other machines in the cluster as well. So this is uh, in the example of this is XPoint, the Intel announcement. And that other presentation I referred to, which is up the top there, INF66324, they're going to go into this in a lot of detail because we've been working pretty hard on the hypervisor side to make sure we can expose this up into the systems. Um, and so there's a lot of changes uh, in, the, in the physical systems and the virtual systems that support this. Um, it's non-volatile. Uh, it's claimed to be, it's about, a, you know, can be up to a thousand times faster than NAND. It says here like a thousand times higher endurance than NAND. I guess this is the other sort of unwritten thing about NAND flash is like it has an endurance cycle and endurance uh, can get really important if you're reading and writing, you're writing the data across these uh, flashes are measured in things drive writes per day, which means if you write more than that amount, maybe 10, then uh, the flash wears out. And so this technology, I think the raw technology, if you're reading and writing large blocks, is something like 10 to 20 times better. If, because of the fact that it's load and store, read and writable, it means that you could rewrite many small pieces of it without having to write the whole page, and that extrapolates out to a 1,000 times more endurance. But think about it as sort of 10 to 20 times more endurance than flash. So it's a, it's a big deal for, for storage. It's real. And so what we see in the storage, software storage architecture is uh, two tiers now. You would see something like first-level caches 
uh, in storage being built on top of this technology. So you can read and write your first level of cache, your write back cache that's in this. Very high endurance, very low latencies. And then the second level is likely to be that capacitor oriented flash, 3D flash that we saw. Um, and so that way I've got a good combination of both the technologies working together. I guess that's the other thing I didn't mention. So the presence of NVM doesn't take away from flash. So flash is separated into these two categories, IOPS and capacity. NVM is really a new category and it's not expected that flash will go away at all. Uh, it's expected we'll see all three levels of these in the hierarchy going forward. So then if we start to look at some of the software solutions, I want to try and walk through, like, what are the different solutions out there and how they fit together? Uh, so this map helps us a little bit. You can see some that are functionally oriented that sit in the left-hand side. There are others that really try and do scale out to get very large numbers of IOPS. And then in this space on the right-hand side, HDFS has been there for a long time, obviously mapped after Google's uh, file system in 2005. It already can do, it's been demonstrated to do hundreds of gigabytes per second, uh, pure software solution running on commodity servers. But there are a couple more showing up here. So MapR does something similar, but it does POSIX file system. So it's sort of better in its semantics than HDFS. It doesn't have these immutable file limitations that you see with HDFS. And you can do random I.O. on it pretty well too. Um, Ceph and Scality are scale out uh, hybrid solutions that are object, block, and file. And so, but they're tilted pretty heavily towards this side up here, which is very high scale, uh, very high capacity, and they have good IOPS capabilities as well. So then what does SDS, or what does software defined storage really mean? And so one way to think about this is to reflect on, well, what is a storage array? And what's really behind it? And how does that translate to SDS? And um, here you can see like a very primitive view of like what a storage array is doing internally. But we buy our array, and what we're really getting is a couple of x86 servers uh, clustered together, and then a shared storage backend, uh, typically out of fiber channel or SAS with a switch fabric in the middle of it, and then a set of drives, SAS or fiber channel SSDs, and then uh, clustered together. So that gives us failover, so that if one side fails, the other side can still see all the disks. Um, and then on top of that, a pretty regular OS running with lots and lots of very proprietary optimizations and changes and then a storage stack on top of it that's going to give you things like services, dedupe, uh, the volumes, mirroring, caching, all the features that you care about are really all software things that are running on top of that uh, stack as well. And the point here is that majority of what's in the array is software. And the servers and the hardware underneath is relatively standard uh, underneath. So the first way of thinking about SDS is um, then Basically, it's the same sort of thing. You could take uh, a clustered array down the bottom, or clustered uh, storage fabric down the bottom, very vertically scaled, so thousands of disks in the extreme, and take two servers, and then go and run your software on top of them. It could just be Linux, Solaris, whatever. Um, and then you have a software-defined storage solution, because this is, could be industry standard hardware that you bought from one company, and this could be your SDS. So it could be your own that you've rolled, or it could be uh, a vendor's SDS. And so these are all the standard servers, and then you'll see even the uh, bigger companies like NetApp and EMC have virtual software solutions that run this way. And there are others too, uh, many others in the industry. I've just sort of picked out a couple. So this will be our first type of SDS. But um, then we want to, there's a couple of different variants to that. And I think the, the limitation of this side is that you had to have a fairly, I've just gone back one slide, you have to have a fairly complex configuration underneath to support this on the storage fabric side. We've got dual ported disks or, or a fabric that lets us have two servers see all the disks. And so if a server fails, you fail over to the server. So a different way of doing that, almost the same thing would be to say, well, let the software do that. And so now instead of having to have fiber channel arrays and a fiber channel uh, switch fabric and everything, I can basically take small servers or it can be big chunky servers, but simpler servers with disks inside of them. And so uh, local SSDs and SATA disks and SAS disks and so forth, all, is, all inside the machine. is a much simpler, much more cost-effective solution at that point in time, and then rack and stack those. The problem is that we probably just took our tr rack of 1,000 disks, and now we can put like 12 or 24 per machine. So this isn't very scalable. Uh, so having just two nodes on this would be a viable software-defined storage, but you wouldn't get a lot of throughput out of this. So, uh, so we're going to go through a couple of ways that you can get more out of uh, better scalable solutions and different alternatives. So 
uh, this would be uh, the first one out of the, the, the group, which is we're seeing a, a set of solutions in, uh, emerging which are, rather than try and solve the problem with a scale-out storage, put a, a software caching tier in front of the compute. So imagine that now we've got this trend emerging, which is all the flash and is like super high IOPS, and we've got NVM coming along. It's feasible to assume that the compute nodes are capable of a million plus IOs per second, every single one of them. And that's a phenomenally different position to what we had in the past. We're always centered around disk IOPS and storage. And so then, but that's not reliable, and it's not easy to program, provision, and everything else. So how do we do that? Well, so one alternative is to basically say, let's take those, that cluster of machines and put a read-write cache that's reliable. So the writes are distributed between peer nodes in the cluster, maybe a 64-node cluster. They're all in memory, or this NVM, or this flash, and you get high IOPS. But then eventually, you need to be able to store that somewhere um, in, for capacity purposes or for mobility that gets you across other machines. And so that lands up in a scale-out tier somewhere else. So that could be uh, an S3 protocol, like object protocol. It could be iSCSI. And there are a number of solutions that show up in this space. So Pernix Data does one that works over, over a traditional block. Uh, Datrium uh, are doing one over S3. Uh, but they're basically following this model. So this is one divergence in the industry is we're seeing a set of solutions showing up and moving in this direction, which is basically to say, well, punt the whole storage thing to uh, make it object storage or cloud storage down the bottom and then just focus on the compute caching tier and make that uh, really high performance. So uh, there are set of, there's actually a lot more than the two I mentioned that are showing up in this space as, as one potential direction. So the next one, next, there's two more, there's three and four. Uh, the next one is Scala SDS. And so this is where we basically say, well, let's take a storage stack and make it scalable. So we're still doing shared nothing on the storage. There's no complicated storage system behind it. We're letting the software layer do replication across the nodes, and then we're presenting data services on top of it. And so this might be three to hundreds of nodes in these configurations. They're, it's all relying on the network to do everything, uh, to do the replication between them and to get the front end access. And so here you would see uh, uh, an access protocol. It could be iSCSI. It's very common for a lot of these. And there's a, there's a bunch of proprietary ones too. So in the proprietary case, you would have a client that runs in your compute node that accesses this SDS. And the client might take care of things like transparent failover between nodes and so forth. So here, the data is basically being replicated between the nodes. We've got a distributed storage stack that takes care of replication and split brains and making sure that uh, membership and quorums are maintained and that that system is very reliable. And then compute is off somewhere else. And it's like a, there's a network in between your storage system and the compute. So some examples of these, uh, uh, Ceph works this way, uh, Scale.io works this way, um, and there are a number of these which are pure software solutions that have these, and quite a few of these have different protocols on the front end of them as well. And then the last one out of the four is hyperconverged, and so this is obviously where vSAN and Nutanix are, and so now we're basically saying, well, let's take the same sort of approach, very uh, distributed storage solution, um, pure software, but we'll integrate that with a hypervisor. So the advantage of doing that is that there's no longer this storage silo anymore that you think about separately. You basically have a bunch of resources, and in all three dimensions, that resource can run nodes of applications, and that application can be completely provisioned by specifying policy and then automating around it, and you don't have to go and manually provision or set up or manage the storage stack separately. So this has a lot of administrative advantages uh, in this model because you can easily uh, provision and manage the system, uh, thinking about it top down from an application perspective. So the path, this is the path we've chosen for vSAN, um, and Nutanix uh, have a, sim a solution in this space as well. There's not too many downsides in this. Sometimes there's questions about the compute to storage ratios that show up here, but um, the top down management is, is, makes this a, a very attractive solution. Okay, so now just a little bit on um, storage interconnects, and then I'll come back and tie a few things together. So storage interconnects are changing pretty rapidly too, uh, and if we think about the, the space here, we've typically thought about storage interconnects as like fiber channel. Like I have my compute, and fiber channel, adapter in the back of the machine, and some sort of big array at the back end. And uh, there's been other alternatives for a while, like uh, iSCSI's been there, uh, but, and the fiber channel over ethernet. 
there's a bunch of new and interesting standards emerging there very rapidly that I think are, are going to take play a, play a pretty big role. Then at the back end, if we're talking about software-defined servers, the storage servers, there are um, different interconnects that can show up, and so uh, SAS, SATA, NVMe are, are, are good examples there. So let's look at those in a bit more detail. So fiber channel is obviously steaming along a uh, pretty, pretty rapid rate. And so you can see here fiber channel getting to 16 gig gigabit. Um, and I think it's a Gen 5 fiber channel. Um, and, but it's basically the, the de facto standard when you've got an array at the back end and you have something at the front end that wants to connect to that through a storage network. These networks are very popular. They're not really that much different from, like if you think about an Ethernet network, it's based on packets. Fiber channel is a network fabric's based on packets. Ethernet's 1,500 bytes. Fiber channel's 2,400 bytes. So they're similar, but fiber channel is built in congestion management, which is a big difference. So Ethernet doesn't have that. It's lossy. So layers above it have to do something about that. And, but for, for a long time, there's been contention about, can this really turn into an Ethernet network? And if you look at the bandwidths that are coming along, uh, we're getting pretty aggressive uh, points on the bandwidth network, a ba bandwidth roadmap for uh, Ethernet. So uh, 40 gigabit Ethernet's there now. There's a bunch of 20, 25 gig Ethernet's uh, showing up with, that seems to be where the commodity is gonna uh, emerge, and that's getting pretty standard pretty quickly. And then we've got 100 gigabit Ethernet working as well. So bandwidth-wise, the network is, is making huge steps forward. But then above it, we've got these other protocols. And so uh, iSCSI's been there for a long time. There's iSUR, um, then RDME. RDMA over Ethernet is enabling us to do interesting low latency things. And NVMe over Fabrics is where some of the interesting work's happening now. I'm gonna come back to that one. Okay, so then going down to the disks. Uh, how do we plug disks into machines? Well, that's actually pretty important because even when we deploy our SDS, like the, these different interconnects have profound difference on the way the software solution performs. We've been finding this uh, makes a very big impact on if we're doing big data solutions where you need a lot of bandwidth out of the servers, this is extremely important, the choice of what to choose here. So uh, this is basically the choices of how to connect. SAS and SATA up the top, very common. Um, we've now got to, you know, just jumping from six to 12 gig uh, SAS, which is 1.2 gigabytes per second. So it's not super fast when you look at some of the other alternatives, sort of hitting a wall there. And then, so to go faster than that, for a while there have been NVMe SSDs, or sorry, SSDs, even without NVMe, you just plug into the PCI bus, and they go a lot faster. And so the latency's lower. The speeds, you can see down the bottom here, Gen 1, 2, 3, or at Gen 3, and we typically have multiple lanes. So four, four lanes uh, might be common. And so that means this plug-in card can do four gigabytes per second. So one gigabyte per second for an SSD for the whole bus of SAS, and one of these cards can do four gigabytes per second. So big data just happens to be that they need between, say, one to two gigabytes a second is a sweet spot for big data. And so these NVMe style or plug-in SSDs have done a lot better for those workloads. But now it's sort of changing again. So uh, there is a new standard which has emerged for the drives, and it started off in the SSD space, and it's, it's getting much wider than that. You know, NVMe, not to be confused with non-volatile memory, NVMe is a standards protocol for plugging in drives. And the drives themselves have got a new connector on them, or the same connector with some new pins. So if you look on the bas back of a NVMe drive, which you can buy now, it looks like a SAS connector, but there's actually some extra pins, which are four lanes of PCI Express. So that bus that was there, on the left um, now comes out all the way to the drive, and it means that these new NVMe SSDs, that you can put like 10 of them in a machine, or can all share these um, much faster buses. Now that is a, now there's a new standard for the electrical signaling and a software protocol around this called NVMe, and so that's the piece that we're seeing uh, emerging very quickly, and like most of the SSDs are moving to this super rapidly. So there's a couple of examples here. You see that Intel went three gigabytes a second, the Samsung and a bunch of other things showing up. So there's a, of course that means the server needs to be wired this way, so the disk slots in the front of the machine need to be NVMe enabled. And there's a few servers already that do that. So Dell has a couple of servers and uh, as, over the next year or two, we'll see a lot more servers that have NVMe slots in the front of them. So what about fabrics? And so this means now I've got a single machine, we've got multiple uh, things connecting to it. And so here we've had iSCSI forever, which is basically SCSI, but over an Ethernet network. And 
That's primarily been used for like slow but wide connectivity and suffers from the congestion management. TCP solves that, but not super good for really low latencies. FCOE basically let you run fiber channel over ethernet. It needed a different ethernet standard to uh, do that reliably. Um, and it's not routable. And so that hasn't been super popular. But the bottom one is interesting. So the NVMe protocol that the SSDs are using has been designed so that all the new fancy stuff in it can actually also run over ethernet. And actually, there's now a working group to put it over fiber channel as well. And so when we see what NVMe can do, um, the fact that that can be one storage protocol that can run all these different fabrics lays the groundwork for like a much simpler storage stack in the machines and uh, in the virtual machines as well. So NVMe over fabrics is different to the NVMe over the PCI Express, which we just saw in the drives, and it lets you go over a network to talk to it. So there are a couple of devices around that are emerging that, that follow this standard, and I think the DSSD one is one of the leading ones. Okay, but then going a little bit wider, what about the rack? So what do we need to think about when we build these systems? Well, PCI Express, which is becoming the connectivity between the storage and the, and the CPUs, is actually switchable, and so there's a lot of commodity switches that are coming out now, and so some of the server rack scale architectures are actually having PCI switches built into them. So you could either do it with something like the DSSD box, that you have PCI and you have a single box, and then the whole rack can be connected by PCI into that. So think about like there's a, this logical switch is in, in the DSSD box, but it's actually just they're multiple ports. Or there could be a switch up the top, which means all the machines are shared. So the difference here is that now every node can see every drive. So if you're building SDS, then we need to think about, oh, okay, now it's not these drives are just in the domain of that server. All the drives in the rack are visible, and I can make my SDS fancier to, to take care of that. There's a couple of examples. So Dell has a PowerEdge system that looks that way. Um, but there's not much SDS that can take advantage of this today. Um, and so the way they look logically is big PCI Express fabric across the rack, all the storage nodes, the servers, connect to all the disks, and you can actually even do fancier things over it like DMA, and so you can treat it really like a network uh, for storage as well. So NVMe, uh, what is this? And so NVMe is, think about it as like if you took SCSI and evolved it to have some NFS-like capabilities and some Vivo-like capabilities, you would end up with NVMe. So NVMe is a new protocol for storage. It has devices, but it also has objects and namespaces in it. So you can take an NVMe device and then create, the specification allows you to create like four billion objects inside of that NVMe device. So it's kind of like a flat file system, many small objects. And that lays the groundwork for the storage device at the back end being much more intelligent. And then you can attach policies to those objects. And you can do all sorts of stuff on that foundation. So the upper layers of this look a lot like, well, that's what we did with Vvols. We Instead of having all the blocks just scattered together, we made it very clear that this object is this VM. And then you can set a policy for speed or replication or whatever based on that. And so NVMe lets us think about all those sorts of policy abstractions because you can now see the objects inside of it. Uh, NVMe is implemented as upper level core, so the protocol and namespaces all become standard. And then underneath it, there's either NVMe over drives, so PCIe to drives. Uh, there's an emerging fiber channel, but this fabrics this piece is now it works over RDMA, it can now go over InfiniBand or Ethernet. So we now have a very rich new storage protocol that supports all these backends. And uh, if you look at some of the latencies that people are measuring now on these, uh, uh, a local RAM disk. So best case, take a machine, put an NVMe fabric, Ethernet, and then storage server at the other end, which is just full of RAM. You're seeing the latency is here down around eight microseconds. So super, super fast, like super low latencies, which means good for all the memory technologies we saw earlier. We don't need to think about those having necessarily having to all be local. And especially when you want to do things like make writes durable by sending them to remote nodes, now we have a way of doing that. So if you think about, this is my, my uh, opinion of what's happening in this space is uh, SATA and SAS have moved to NVMe. Um, very rapid. It's happening like most of the drives you buy now are that way. Uh, the, and then if we think about the future things like SCSI and Fiber Channel, there's a pretty good chance that that space is going to move to NVMe Fabrics if NVMe Fabrics gets enough consensus among the industry. Um, and obviously Ethernet moving at the speed it's moving with these 20, 40, and 100 gig, that's a good foundation for running those. So we do have to figure out the RDMA thing. We have to figure out who and how we get RDMA support and all the Ethernet adapters, whether it's going to be rocky, back to that, that um, 
chicken and egg problem, but I think NVMe will be the thing that pushes RDMA uh, he heavily. And so this is a very important standard, and I think we'll see it uh, on the software-defined storage on the client server sides in the future as well. So yeah, the summary there being um, magnetic storage almost phasing out. You can see the IOPS thing crossing over 15 k IPM drives. But even on capacity, that 3D flash pushing it out soon. Um, and then the interconnects getting this big transitions getting pushed uh, that can happen pretty rapidly here. OK, so then the last little section here is just thinking about uh, beyond block storage. Like, what about all the other protocols that are really fall under the umbrella of software-defined storage? What about object storage? What about key value stores? Uh, all those types of things. Where do they fit into this map? And if you look at that same matrix, you can see like there's a lot of databases down there that all have their own proprietary SQL things, which are really storage primitives. Um, up the top, we've got a bunch of very fast SQL-like things. And then on the top right, we've got all the object store protocols. And then the bottom, we've got HDFS and POSIX, which are like file semantics. So how do you get all those in a software-defined storage world? And the state of the world today is that if you go to, like I was talking to uh, Twitter the other day, and it's like, sure, yeah, they've got like all these different silos of storage. And these are clusters that are independently managed. So you can imagine they have a, uh, an object storage system. They have a key value system called Manhattan. Um, they have some Cassandra. They have some Hadoop. And so these different teams need to buy different machines with different compatibility lists run and manage these systems differently. And so it's back to the world pre-virtual machines where you had silos of individual management. So this is a problem waiting to get solved. And there's really two ways to do this. And one of them is to say, well, we're going to enter the market with a multi-protocol stack that does everything. <laughs> and uh, you can see the unicorns on here. <laughs> because it really you can't really do this effectively. Because you can sort of get partway there with object and block. because Object is a reasonably well-defined standard, so you could, you could take a run at that. But when you go and say, OK, now I'm going to be a key value store, well, are you as good as at MongoDB at indexing? And do you have really powerful query semantics like MongoDB? And um, if you're like Cassandra, do you have flexible replication options for eventually consistent? All this stuff that like, the database companies are very differentiated and have years and years of differentiation in for the developers, you can't possibly compete with that. So it's unlikely, extremely unlikely, that this solution will ever work to that degree. Um, so, but it would be great if it did, because now you could just say, oh, I just manage this one software stack, and I can have all these clusters of machines down the bottom, and I provide all these storage resources as services to the other, uh, the other BUs. Um, so a more likely approach, and this is, uh, I think, a much more likely approach that emerges, is the software-defined storage platform becomes something that runs and manages software-defined storage hardware primitives and networks. So all those standard machines with NVMe and Flash and all the stuff we saw and all the networking primitives are presented in such a way that you can run different storage engines on top of them. And so HDFS would be one example. I could run HDFS on my SDS platform, and then I can provide for Hadoop files. Then I can maybe take Ceph and run 50 nodes of Ceph and then have an object storage layer. Uh, same way I can run Mongo, MySQL, all these different things can now run on the platform. This is doable because the requirements for each of those uh, systems, those data services, are much more uh, standardized and, and can be made common. So they need things like um, groups of persistence, which look like VMDKs. They need um, policies on those. They might need fault domains to be able to organize them such that the replication is in the right place. They may need uh, different levels of performance. Might Mongo might need a logging, uh, a logging file, a logging data, data store that has very low latency behind it, for example. So you, you basically want to be able to prescribe all these things, all these things through uh, policy and that, let them get provisioned through the SDS layer. So this is the energy we're investing uh, at the moment actually into vSAN, is that vSAN will become a platform so that you can run these other workloads on top of it uh, and then let us uh, be able to provide a much wider set of uh, primitives on top of it. And so this is, um, this is likely uh, to happen in multiple flavors in the industry. Uh, and I think vSAN would just be one of, one of the approaches that go down this path. But this, I think, is much more uh, likely and more successful than the previous. And then we can get to the, the situation where, OK, now I have um, one type of machine that I order and buy. And so when I think about, like, what's the HCL? Which SSDs, which controller cards, which servers, which CPUs, 
well, it's all the same thing, just by the same one. Uh, maybe we're different, maybe you have a couple of different big, small, medium, large uh, types of configuration. Uh, but you can get to a HCL which is manageable. So when I order a machine, I know what to order. And then a uh, software layer, the software that manages those, would take care of things like um, when a drive fails or a machine fails, it, sh it communicates with the operator of that cluster in a uniform way. It's not different for HDFS versus Ceph. It's like, no, there's a machine here with a, a, a drive that's out. And so that software-defined storage layer commonalizes all of the administrative functions related to the hardware cluster. And then you have domain-specific administration on top of these. So yes, there's going to be a person that manages HDFS, and there's going to be a person that manages Ceph, but they're managing them as a data service. They don't need to think about hardware anymore. If they want more nodes, they just spin up more virtual nodes. Uh, not to think about like, what machine that's running on and, and what the implications are behind. So this is a great place to get to, and I think that over the next couple of years, this is where the industry will be focusing a bit of energy on to, to tackling this space next. So with that, I think we've covered here. Um, I'll finish up and uh, maybe leave a couple of minutes for questions. If there are any.